Yeah. Um, my question is, so we hear the, often a famous report that uh, Rabbi Akiva darshaned laws from the crowns of the letters in the Torah. And like that, that board gets like thrown around a lot just in general, but does it say anywhere the exact laws that he darshaned? No, no. Uh, the Gemara Menachos says that, um, in fact, it's a very strange Gemara. Uh, the Gemara Menachos says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed Moshe Rabbeinu at Sinai all of the future generations. And uh, he saw Rabbi Akiva, who was darshaning halachais from the crowns, the tagin, right? Certain letters in the Torah. Uh, there are six letters that have uh, crowns in the uh, Torah, like on top of the letter. Uh, shin, ayin, actually spells, the first word is shatnes. Shin, ayin, tes, nun, zayin. And then gets, gimel, tzadi, shatnes, gets. Uh, I don't know what gets means, shatnes is, we know what shatnes is. And Rabbi Akiva was darshaning halachais from the tagin. And uh, he was saying things that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't even understand. And Moshe Rabbeinu felt very uh, unhappy until Rabbi Akiva said, oh, this is a halacha la Moshe Misinai. So Moshe said, oh, Baruch Hashem. And now the question is, if it was a halacha la Moshe Misinai, how could it be that Moshe didn't understand? Moshe, Moshe presumably got the halacha, right? So uh, the answer would be either Moshe saw this before Hashem gave him the halacha, uh, or alternatively, uh, the Lashon Halacha Mosh Sinai means my drasha is based on a principle that Hashem gave Moshe, even though Moshe did, wasn't given the application that Rabbi Akiva drew. Right? In other words, if I give you a principle and you derive certain applications from my principle, I might not have thought of those applications, but they're still from my principle. In fact, that's a big sight in Teresh of Peh. I, I say this many, many times. Uh, we say the Torah Shabbat was given to Moshe B'Sinai. That doesn't mean that every single Shaila in the Gemara even was g uh, given to Moshe B'Sinai. If that would be the case, how could there be a machlokas? Chayev, Pater, Mutter, Aser. But the Ran says Hashem gave Moshe Klolim out of which applications could be derived. And therefore, as the Rambam writes, uh, two people could start off with the same kalalim, but they could differ as to how you apply those kalalim. And that's why it's shayach hamach lokas. Okay, but your specific question, does the Gemara tell us what specific halachas Rabbi Akiva derives from Tagin? Uh, no, it does not. Yeah? How should we deal with um, activities or ways of culture that, 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 that comes in from the Goyim? Uh, for example, the dress code or the siren that, that goes off on Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron. Yeah, well, first of all, you, you do see uh, that obviously there's a lot that we do in our lives that uh, had its origin in non-Jewish society. For example, uh, even the basic dress code. I mean, even Hasidim, like who wear a strimal and a long coat, that itself was based on the non-Jewish Polish dress code of nobility, although it goes back a long way, uh, the 1500s or whatever it is. But you know, to give an example, in the 19th century, when uh, part, of, part of Poland wanted to obliterate Hasidus as a separate movement, and they decreed that you're not allowed to wear a strimal, the Chedushi Arim had said, this is Yaharik Val Yavor, because uh, the Goyim are trying to take you away from Yiddishkeit, even though the strimal itself came from Chukos HaGoyim. And then you have the siren, the moment of silence, etc. But the truth of the matter is, there is a very, very important Yisait from a very, very great Acharon, one of the greatest of the poskim. This is the Maharik. Maharik is Rav Yosef Colon, who was an Italian posek. And uh, the Ketzais writes about the Maharik, that the Maharik is considered to be Migdole Achreinim Mamesh. Uh, so what he says is very important. And he says that the Isser of Chuko Sagoyim is only if the practice of the Goy is either uh, a form of worshiping Avaita Zara, in other words, there was a religious meaning to it, or it's a minog shtus, in other words, foolish that has no logic. So he says, things that make sense, for example, you know, wearing a shorter jacket, there are reasons for it that it shouldn't get caught in machinery, <laughs> or whatever, whatever it is, that's not nichlal and chukos agayim. And it would appear that uh, a siren or a moment of silence, too, is not necessarily something that would be us or us chukos agayim because uh, it's, a, it's a Svaradik a way of, it's a, a way of honoring. I mean, uh, honoring uh, people. Uh, it's not a Dover without Tom. 
By the way, this is one of the issues of Halloween. Remember, uh, I'm sure you remember Halloween. Um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, even people who were Shomer Shabbos, uh, I don't know what people do today, it was relatively common that uh, kids went uh, trick-or-treating. You know, you go trick-or-treating. Now today, trick-or-treating bichlal is out of vogue because uh, they, may put a, they may put poison in the candy. There are other reasons why people don't do trick-or-treating as much today. But the inter interesting halachic question is, let's take two non-Jewish festivals and analyze them under the Mariks idea. Let's take Thanksgiving and let's take Halloween. So Thanksgiving is a very big issue, right? Are you allowed to celebrate Thanksgiving? And what do we mean by celebrate? What if you're just having turkey? I mean, you're not celebrating the holiday, but it's a day off, etc. So Thanksgiving, there is a machlokas, and the primary idea is that Thanksgiving seems to have a religious origin of praising God, and the God that they were praising is not our God, it's Yashka and the like. So according to some opinions, any special uh, celebration of Thanksgiving would be chukos hagoyim. According to others, uh, the idea is that it's thanksgiving to the creator. So even though they meant one thing, we can mean something else. Now, Halloween is a different Indian. Halloween, some say, besides the fact that it may have had its origin in paganism, even pre-Christianity, uh, but it also falls under the other category of minak shtus, like there's no swara for it, there's no logic for it, and therefore that would be usher. And there's, there are two different reasons why something might be usher under Chukos Agayim. One is it has a shaykhus to Avaydah Zorah, and the other is it is a minak shtus, that is not a seichel de kedavar. But other types of things that we get from the goyim, if it doesn't connect to Avaydah Zorah, and there, it's something of swara, that we're allowed to follow. I mean, that's why, I mean, you think about it, that's why we use telephones. I mean, you know, we use all sorts of things we get from the goyim. We don't say uh, using a telephone would be chesama uh, chukos goyim because it's something that uh, helps, something that makes sense, right? So this is a, a yisait of the marik. Now, to take it further, let's take things like yoga. Uh, yoga or alternative medicine, like acupuncture or other things. So is a Jew allowed, a religious Jew allowed to either do them, can I be an acupuncturist, or can I receive acupuncture treatments? Well, it's very, very clear that Eastern medicine had its roots, and yoga as well, had its roots in Avodah Zarah. Right, even some of the language of yoga is, is based on uh, Hinduism and, 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 and the like. But the question, be, so, so there you might say it's Chukos Agayim, because, but on the other hand, some say that after a while it gets kashered, it gets so minutic, it gets so separated from its religious origin that yoga becomes a relaxation mechanism and acupuncture becomes just a medical treatment. In other words, the fact that, was, that it was invented by idolaters does not ma make it forbidden if it no longer has a connection to that religious worship. Right? So uh, many would allow yoga. Uh, some don't. Again, in every, in every side of here, there'll be people who will be more machmer on the union of Chugos Agayim. So it is a complicated thing. Now, another thing, just a final point about this. Normally, you would think that if we had a minhag first, that Goyim took over, there should be no problem with us continuing our minna just because Goyim took it over. I mean, you know, the Pope wears the Yamaka, you know, whatever, whatever it would be, uh, because we, we didn't get it from the Goyim. And yet, there is an example of a minna that the Vilna Gaon asers, al Shuko Sagoyim. You know, it's brought down uh, in books of Minhagim that on the Yom Tif of Shavuos, there was a minna, in fact, some of you might see this in your own shuls, it's not practiced in the yeshiva world so much, primarily because of the gra, in which they would put trees and plants. They would decorate the shul with plants on shavuos, greenery. And why that was done for shavuos? Again, some say because, number one, on shavuos, the Mishnah says, Hashem judges us on peiro saw elon, on the fruit of the tree. Others say at matan taira, all of the trees blossomed and bloomed. So there are different reasons why there was a minog to decorate a shul with vegetation and trees, uh, seedlings or saplings on Shavuos, 
But the Gra absolutely answered it, and the Gra said, it is chuko sagoyim, since the goyim bring trees into their sanctuaries or homes as part of religious worship. He seems to be referring to a Christmas tree. And therefore, that's enough to make it chuko sagoyim. Uh, even though our minog was way before there was uh, that problem. Uh, another example uh, is that uh, there were many gedolim who were very, very makbid not to make a chuppah, not to marry a couple in a, ba- in a shul. In a shul. Now, on one hand, the Ramah says anyway, a chuppah should be under the heaven. Right, so that's pashat. But this is a separate thing, meaning even if you would allow a chuppah to be in a house or in a base medrash, you would not make it in a base knesseth. Why? Some poskim say, because that's chukos hagoyim, because the goyim make their religious weddings inside of the church. Their lechar, it's also difficult, right? Because it's not that we're borrowing it from them, we're just doing it because Marriage is a holy thing. You're doing it in the base Knesset. So you do find occasionally, I don't have a clear explanation, that chukos ha-goyim can even kick in when we were doing it before, but the goyim took it, uh, took it over. And I'll give you an example from the Chumash itself. Uh, although it's not called chukos ha-goyim, but it's the same idea. Uh, the Torah says in Parsha Shoftim that when you build an altar to sacrifice to Hashem, you should not make a matseva Asher sonei Hashem aleikecha, that Hashem hates. Matseva means a monument. So Rashi explains what is the difference between a mizbeach and a matseva. Rashi says a mizbeach is many stones. A matseva is one big stone. And the Torah is saying when we build a mizbeach, it should be of many stones, not just one big stone. He doesn't say why. Now, but then Rashi says, even though in the days of the Avais, the Matseva was beloved, right? Avraham built Matseva, Yitzchak, Yaakov, they built Matseva. But since the Goyim then used the Matseva for Avaidah Zorah, that was their customary altar, Hashem now hates it. And we're not allowed to use it. It's mamish an example of <laughs> something that was beloved by Hashem, but because it was appropriated by the Yev the Perhaps, I don't know, perhaps that's a mucker for the Gras idea that you don't bring trees into the shell because the appropriation made it repugnant. By the way, uh, it does not explain uh, what, what is the difference. I mean, what, what is the idea here that um, the Goyim used the single stone altar and that became repugnant, but we use the multiple stone altar. Spiritually, well, what's the nafkamina? Like, why is one beloved and one hated? So Rav Cook has a very interesting essay that a single stone connotes a notion of monolithic, that, Hashem, that their gods don't want people to be individuals. They want everybody to kind of have a blind conformity. Mashiach and in Klal Yisrael, we want everybody to have their own unique approach in Avodah Hashem, so you have different stones, like different shvatim and the like, and that shows us that uh, the true unity of Klal Yisrael is not sameness, but it's the idea that each one has their own unique mission. Yeah? Um, say there's a, a synagogue, and there's, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a woman Hazan, and <laughs> yeah. there's, 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 there's 10 um, adult men so in what circumstances can one enter such a place or even uh, partake in the uh, minion? Like, you know, it's interesting. Be, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, somebody asked me a shayla. It was hard for me to believe that they heard that a certain woman got a psak, uh, that her voice was so bad there was no iser of kol isha uh, to listen to her sing. <laughs> so he asked me, could there be such a psak? So I, I said... Well, I hear it in Svara, but I, I kind of doubt that there would actually be such a psak to start differentiating between people with good voices and people with bad voices. Uh, but I'm assuming if the woman is a chazanit, technically, I'm assuming she probably has a nice voice, otherwise uh, she wouldn't get the job. So there are a few problems. There are technical problems, and then there are more broader philosophical problems. The technical problem is very, very simple. Uh, I am not allowed to daven in the presence of a woman singing. Uh, there's an issue of Kol Isha. 
That, and now remember, Kolisha has to, okay, maybe I should clarify this for a moment. I don't want to get into a whole share about Kolisha, but the law of Kolisha has two different components that you shouldn't confuse. There is a component that I'm not allowed to listen to a woman sing. Now that halacha only applies if it's not my wife or my daughter, right? I am allowed to listen to my wife or my daughter saying I'm not allowed to listen to another woman sing. But there's another halacha that uh, the vo because the voice of a woman could be sexually provocative, I'm, uh, the singing voice, I'm not allowed to learn or daven or recite brachos as a woman is singing. That halacha actually applies even to your own wife. Meaning I am not allowed to daven if my wife is singing. And that is why there's a Shiloh with Shabbos mirrors. How does that work? You know, you sing benching together. I, there are different questions. So one problem with, with the proposal is Kolisha. But that doesn't fully answer your question because, well, okay, but can, can we daven like uh, when she's not singing? I mean, she's not going to be singing 100% uh, of the time. So there is a general idea. This came, I'll tell you where this came up. This came up a lot with shoals that didn't have a mechitza. In fact, if you know the history of American orthodoxy, in fact, uh, I believe that maybe there's one shul that still has the standard. There was a time when the OU, the Orthodox Union, which is a group of synagogues essentially, did allow synagogues to be members of the OU even if they didn't have a mechitza. In other words, they were so-called, I don't know why, they were so-called Orthodox synagogues, they didn't yet have a mechitza. I believe they kept on kicking them out and ushering it and requiring it. I think, I think maybe there's one shul in America that officially is still connected to the OU. Now, Rav Soloveitchik had poskined at the time. He was like the posek uh, for the OU and for the Rabbinical Council of America that you were not allowed to enter a base Knesset that was structured by violating halacha. Mm -hmm. Meaning even if you're going to miss tefillah but seaborn, and even if you're going to miss shoifer blowing on Rosh Hashanah, because you could ask me that question. I mean, listen, if I'm just coming in to hear the shofar being blown, and I'm not even davening there, and let's assume that's the only opportunity to hear shoifer, what's us? There? There's no kolisha there, right? And yet, Rav Soloveitchik said, it's a getter of a chilul Hashem to daven in a synagogue that is violating halacha in the structure of its services. So generally speaking, I think we would say, if there's a woman chazanit, you would not be allowed to daven with a minion in that room at all. Now, could you daven in other rooms? Could you daven? Uh, that's an interesting question, and may maybe yes. Even, if, even in a conservative reform synagogue, there may be a makam to permit orthodox minyanim outside of the main sanctuary. If you know what I mean. In other words, in some, this, is, this is an arrangement. Uh, in some conservative and reform synagogues, there may be a small group of traditionally minded people who want to have a service with a mechitza, and you know, according to halacha, uh, but the problem is they're going to hold it in the building of the reform synagogue, but some will say it's okay as long as they're not in the sanctuary in which they have the reform uh, service. So. In your specific question, I think the general answer would be you should not dive in there at all. But if there's a separate room, uh, you can make a minion in that separate room. Okay? Yeah. This is a sermon. <clears throat> How many minutes after Shkia can one say Sefira with a bracha? And also, Friday night, Mar, if we end up saying Shema 25 minutes after Shkia, does one have to repeat it? Would this be based on the proximity of Los Angeles to the equator? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the question is the question of zamanim. Uh, the question is, when is night night? Uh, and this is a huge, huge subject. I mean, there are many, many, many svarim, whole svarim that are written just on this topic alone. When is Shabbos over? When is it night? When can you count Sefira with a bracha? And, you know, I mean, I myself own probably six uh, whole svarim on this subject, and I know that I only own a fraction of the svarim that are written on it, so... It's a big, 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 big topic. But the basic rule here is that from the time that the sun sets, we enter a period that is called Bein Hashmashos, which the closest English translation is twilight. And twilight uh, is, in halacha, safek yom safek laila, meaning maybe it's halachically day, maybe it's halachically night. 
So as a result, bein hashmashas, you have to be machmer on both sides of the equation. That is why Shabbos has to begin no later than sunset, because maybe bein hashmashas is night. But you can't end Shabbos at sunset, because maybe bein hashmashas is day. That's why Shabbos and Yom Kippur, by definition, have to be longer than 24 hours, because you have to go from Shkia till Vadai Laila. So the question then becomes, okay, the starting point of Bein Hashemashas is relatively clear, although that also has a machlokas, but let's go la halacha. Bein Hashemashas starts Shkia. But when does Bein Hashemashas end, right? So that's the famous machlokas, meaning when it ends, it's called Tseis HaKochavim. Tseis HaKochavim is Vadai Laila. When is Tseis HaKochavim thereby ending Bein Hashemashas? Right? You understand, the ending of Bein Hashemashas is synonymous with Tseis HaKochavim. So this is the fundamental machlokas between what is often called the Shita of the Ga'inim and the Shita of Rabbeinu Tam. The Ga'inim say the duration of Bein Hashemashas is the amount of time that it takes to walk three-fourths of a mil. Now, a mil is 2,000 amas, and there's a machlokas if the shear of a hiluch mil is 18 minutes, 22 minutes, or 24 minutes. <laughs> there's multiple shitas everywhere, but let's go with 18 minutes. So according to the Ga'inim, Ben Hashemashas is very short. It is three-fourths of 18 minutes. So it's right, 15 and a half minutes or so. Now, I'll explain that. So according to the Ga'inim, this may sound very, very odd. According to the Ga'inim, from Shkia to Tzeza Kochavim is only uh, less than 16 minutes. Rabbeinu Tam basically says that uh, the shear of Bein Hashemashais is going to be 4 mil, which adds up to 72 minutes if you go with 18, right? So this is the famous thing. Is Bein Hashemashai 16 minutes? or is Bein Hashemash 72 minutes? Now, very important uh, qualification to all of this. Mm. When Rabbeinu Tam and the Ga'inim say it's either 16 minutes, Berech, or 72 minutes, they are referring to an equinox day, a day of exactly 12 hours from sunrise to sunset. Now, that would mean different times of the year it's going to be long, which means according to the Ga'inim, it can sometimes be as long as 30 or 35 minutes. Like Rabbeinu Tam, it might be as long as 90 minutes or, or, or whatever, whatever it would be. So this is the result of all of the different uncertainties. And then, of course, there's also a mitzvah. They add, add on to Shabbos, so they add on like 10 minutes to whatever you time. That's where you get the 42 minutes, is based on the Gaonim. Um, so the thing you need to know is that the length of Bein Hashemashas, right? You, whether it's the 16 minutes that gets longer or whether it's the 72 minutes that gets longer, it is not a summer-winter thing. It's a common mistake. Because all of us know in the summer, the days are longer. In the winter, the days are shorter. That actually has nothing to do with Bein Hashemashas. That does not determine the length of twilight. What determines, again, you said this in your question, what determines the length of twilight is proximity to the equator. And that is the closer you are to the equator, the shorter the period of twilight is. That's why, for example, in Israel, you will notice that it gets dark very quickly after sunset, uh, where in New York or Paris or London, it takes much, much, much longer. So essentially, this is measured astronomically in a bit of a complicated way, and that's called an angle of depression, meaning to say you measure how many degrees under the horizon the sun must be in order to generate the darkness <coughs> of either 16 minutes or 72 minutes on an equinox day, meaning you kind of say, how dark is it on the perfect day at 16 minutes, and how dark is it on the perfect day? 72 minutes. And that's an angle of depression. Now, when you have that same angle of depression 
in a shorter day or a longer day, that will be the equivalent of night. I hope this is making, making sense, okay? And that's how calendars are built. This is called ma'alot. Ma'alot are angles of depression. So in reality, in reality, uh, if you go with the ga'onim, that uh, you're working with only a 16 minute on a perfect equinox a day, uh, under no circumstances would you, would you ever have to wait more than 35 minutes for the end of Shabbos. But because of Tosefes Shabbos, it's universally the case that we wait 40 minutes or 42 minutes. But that's Tosefes Shabbos. But 35 is going to be your maximum in terms of actual Shabbos. Like Rabbeinu Tam, it would be 72 plus whatever extra you need for the angle of depression. So uh, you are correct. Um, Los Angeles... Uh, you will reach that level of darkness uh, earlier than New York, but it's still uh, uh, later than Israel. I mean, Israel is, is closer to the equator, uh, as it were. Okay, so again, it's a very complicated subject, and the one thing you will notice is that all calendars essentially pick a uniform time to end Shabbos. In other words, theoretically, Shabbos would end a different time every, I, I don't mean, of course it ends a different time, but I don't mean that. It would end a different number of minutes after Shkia every week. In other words, some weeks it would end after 20 minutes, and some 25 minutes, and some 17 minutes, and some 35 minutes. But you'll notice that no calendars are structured that way. Meaning, every calendar will always end Shabbos every week a fixed number of minutes after sunset. Yes, sunset will change, but it'll always be the fixed number of minutes, 42 minutes or 72 minutes. And the reason that's done is a very simple, it's not accurate, but it's done just to make things simple. Essentially, the latest number of minutes after Shkia, that you achieve that level of darkness will be taken as your standard ending of Shabbos. You see what I'm saying? Meaning, theoretically, it is the magnitude of darkness that ends, the, ends Ben Hashemashas. And the magnitude of darkness will change. The duration of twilight changes. But calendars do not account for the change in the duration of twilight they will always count a uniform number of minutes, whatever their cheshben is, because that just makes it simple. So the well-known statement, let's say, if you don't follow Rabbeinu Tam, Shabbos is over 42 minutes after Shkia, is actually not an accurate statement, but it's taking the longest twilight of the year and making that the standard of every single week, so it's not going to be recomputed every week. Okay, I hope, I hope it makes sense. It's a complicated so yeah. In terms of the in terms of saying a bracha for Shkia. Like oh, okay, Shkia. okay, okay. So practi okay, so so let's take serious. So 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 for Svira Saimer, we have a, a different question because I've been talking mainly about Shabbos and Yom Kippur, which are do rises. Svira Saomer, there's a big, big machlokus Rishinim. Is counting the Omer a Torah commandment? Or is counting the Omer a rabbinic commandment? Shita uh, Sataisus is that Svira Sa'imer Bizman Hazer is only Midra Banan because the Doraisa is only when you bring the Korban Omer, when you have a Beis Amikdash. And since today we don't have the Beis Amikdash and we don't bring the barley offering, Svira is Midra Banan. That's what Tosua says. Because the Doraisa, it has to be Toloi and the Korban Ha'imer. The Rambam, on the other hand, maintains that the mitzvah of Svira Sa'imer is not connected to the Korban Ha'imer, and Svira is the Arisa. Now, what is the practical difference if Svira is the Rabbanan or Svira the Arisa? And that is, can you count with a bracha Bain Hashmashes? If I hold that Svira Sa'imer is the Rabbanan, and Bein Hashemashas is a Safek Yom, Safek Laila, I'm allowed to invoke the principle Safek Drabban. And if I'm in doubt whether I'm fulfilling a rabbinic commandment or not, I could be lenient. So I would be allowed to count Bein Hashemashas after Shkia, like Tosvas, like the Rambam. Since Svira Saimer is the Arisa, 
I would have to wait until I've left Bein Hashmashas because a suffix on a mitzvah diaraisa, I have to be l'chumra. That's why you'll notice that in many shuls, particularly more modern Orthodox shuls, they daven myriv before tzesa kochavim, after sunset, before tzesa kochavim, and they count the omer with the bracha. And you wonder, how could they count the omer with the bracha? It's not tzesa kochavim yet. The answer is they're following the poskim, tosis ashita, that the counting of the omer is midrabanan, so it's suffix drabanan lakula. On the other hand, it's true that a, a ben Torah should, should be machmer and try not to count till afterwards because of Doraisa. In fact, this is an interesting brain teaser a little bit. Suffolk to Rabbanan Lakula. Suffolk to Rabbanan Lachumra. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Suffolk to Rabbanan Lakula, Suffolk to Raisa Lachumra, right? What if you have a Suffolk if something is the Raisa or to Rabbanan? <laughs> Meaning, if I knew the mitzvah is the Raisa, I'd have to be strict. If I knew the mitzvah was Rabbanan, I could be Mekah. But here we have a machlokes, is it the Arais or Drabana? Right, so how do you apply the two different rules of Suffolk when it is a Suffolk if it's the Arais or Drabana? So it's Kedai to be Machmer because there may be a Arais involved. Okay, so given that difference, so the question then becomes, I know I'm taking a long time here, so assuming you're following or you're Machmer like the Rambam and you're not going to count Bein so when, uh, how early, after Shkia, how soon after Shkia would you be allowed to count uh, with, a, uh, with a bracha? Um, it's, it's hard to answer, but, but generally speaking, uh, 35 minutes after Shkia, uh, you could rel- safely count with a bracha. Some days it's going to be earlier, because remember, on an equinox day, the Ga'inim uh, give us a uh, 16 minutes. So it'll be between 16 minutes and 35 minutes. 35 minutes is a maximum. And even people who are machmer like Rabbeinu Tam, 72 minutes, generally they are machmer only for Shabbos and Yom Kippur. They're, they're not machmer for Tainus, uh, like Tisha B'av, and they wouldn't be machmer for Svira. So I would say uh, 35 minutes, you, you, you are vadai in a safe zone, and in some weeks it would be as early as 16 minutes. Uh, yeah. Um, if one wants to learn and apply a practical halakha and they don't have either the time or the capability to really go through the Shulchanara from all the Makoros and they want to buy a, a, a safer from the store, some practical Shabbos or Brachos safer, is, is that like really a Yashar like thing to do because they're basically like being Kabbal this rub as their Hosek? But the, that rub of the safer might not be like their posik. Like, like I bought a Rocco safer, and it was a very nice safer. And then when I started learning it more in depth, I saw they were bringing like Shom Zaman, but it was like a Das Yatid when there were other posts in that argument on it, and he didn't bring that. So, like, I'm just being macabre this Das Yatid now because like, I bought the safer. Well, well, well listen, listen, you know, Perky Avas tells us. Um, or you have to have a Rebbe, meaning, meaning to say, with all of the books that Baruch Hashem are available, and some of them are, are quite excellent, uh, you still need a Rav. I mean, a, a, a Sefer will either not bring all of the views, or sometimes it's confusing in the other direction. They bring you every single Shita, and you don't know what to do. In fact, I've always, you know, sometimes I, you know, will get a Shaila, I'll look up something in Shmir Shabbos Golchasa, so it says, um, uh, if you have this Shaila, ask a competent Rabbi. Well, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I guess, I guess I'm not a competent rabbi. <laughs> right? That's going to be a problem with all of these books. So that's why you, know, you need a rav. You need a posek. You need somebody that you can talk to. On the other hand, that doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, you can get a lot of yedios uh, from the svarim. You can get a lot of background. Uh, you can understand the area of halacha better. Of course, without the Gemaras, you don't fully understand it, but you can still get a you know, pretty good Havana. So I think overall, uh, it is very Kedai to have these Svarim, but you need to know that they don't really replace a Rav. And in the ultimate sense, they don't replace learning the Sugya uh, Be'im. By the way, a little, little commercial. Uh, there is a set of Svarim, you can get it either in Hebrew or English. I think it's like 11 volumes. Uh, you know, paperback volumes. It's called Surva Mirabanan, 
And it's a very interesting series in which uh, they take halachic areas like Natila Shadayim, Hilchos Shabbos, Hilchos Tefillah, and they address a number of issues, not everything, and they give you the makora so you can kind of learn uh, the sugya of the Tila Shadayim. What's a chatzitza? For example, they'll say, uh, when is a bandage a chatzitza for the Tila Shadayim? And they'll give you, you know, the Gemara, the Rosh, Tosvos, the Rambam, they kind of reproduce the sources. So it's a way that you can get a, a pretty good Havana of at least selected halachas. It doesn't give you every, every, every halacha. Like yeah. Well, yes. I mean, you have to be sure the machaber is a bar samcha. I mean, I would, I would very much look at that. what are the haskamas to the sefer. But assuming the machaber is a reliable person, then yeah, yeah. If I if I don't have anyone to ask, uh, and I'm not capable of going through the sugya myself in full, so I follow what the sefer says. I mean, if the sefer says Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach matured it, even if he turns out to be a das yachid. <laughs> I would just, well, maybe I shouldn't speak for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but I think after 120 years, if you tell HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I followed Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach, I, I think you'll be okay. I don't think you'll be in trouble uh, for that. So you could follow, follow those shittas for sure. Yeah. I was reading earlier today, in Strive for Truth by Rav Dessler, that the, every material object has a spiritual function. So what's the true, how do we know what the true function is for every material object? Yeah, so the, the, uh, now what Rav Dessler's statement is 100% true, although I, he doesn't need my haskama, that everything that Hashem created in the world, everything, can be used for kedusha, can be elevated, can be sanctified, can be something that facilitates Avedas Hashem and Kiddush Hashem. And that is why Judaism maybe has a different worldview than Christianity. Uh, classical Christianity might have taught that the material world is evil and you must escape it. That's why you don't get married, etc. Judaism teaches we can embrace physicality and we can elevate it. The challenge is, however, that we have to be careful to elevate the physical and not be dragged down by the physical. Meaning to say, uh, we have to try to understand what is the function of Kedusha that the material world can have, and how can I discover it, how can I uncover it, how can I use it properly? Uh, the short answer is you don't always know. Uh, so for example, if you would ask me, what is the spiritual value of cocaine, uh, I would be a little hard pressed, although theoretically there may be some answer to that as well. But if you take something very simple like um, food, clothing, uh, an automobile, a car, a computer, although these are not creations of God per se, clearly there are beneficial and holy uses that we can put to it, right? We can use uh, cars and uh, to get to shul and get to the base medrash and to, to do mitzvahs with. Uh, eating and drinking gives us the physical vitality to be able to serve Hashem. So this is what the Rambam says. Even things like, uh, although I'm broadening the question a little bit, things like going on vacation, things like jogging, playing basketball, if you're doing it to be healthy, uh, so you can do mitzvahs better. The Rambam writes, that's called Avodah Sashem. The basketball game itself is Avodah Sashem. And this is based on the Pasuk in Mishle, Bechol Drachah Da'eyu. You should know God in all of the ways of your life, everything that you do. So you're right, things can be abused, right? Uh, things can be abused. Uh, but you try to, to ask yourself, how can I use this in a way to sanctify HaKadosh Baruch Hu? and make myself a better person in his service. Uh, so people say, so look, it's, uh, sometimes it's a little, it, it seems a little pretentious, but it represents a very noble idea. You ever hear, wherever at someone's house, they pick up a piece of food on Shabbos, and they say, L'chavod Shabbos Kodesh, and they eat it. Again, I have to admit, and this is my prejudice, really, and maybe I shouldn't even bother to tell you this, it, I'm, I'm a little off-put by it. It sounds sometimes a little bit of a, it looks like a guy but they could gesture a little bit, so I don't like it personally, but that's my Mishugas. Don't, don't learn from my Mishugas. Mm -hmm. Because it does express a beautiful idea. And that is, yes, I'm eating fancy food, and yes, I'm enjoying myself. But I'm trying to turn this into honoring Hashem by honoring the day of Shabbos. So even if you don't say it, 
it wouldn't be so bad to, uh, not to think it, right? Think about it. Think about it a little bit. And that way you're changing what would have been just self-gratification and stuffing yourself into a way of glorifying a Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's what Rav Dessler is talking about. Yeah. Uh, here's a send-in. Uh, if someone learns Torah, not Lishma, for, for instance, solely to gain interesting information, not for Hashem Bekwal, are they Yotze, the mitzvah of Talmud Torah? Yeah, so if someone learns Torah, not for the sake of serving Hashem or even keeping the mitzvahs, but simply because intellectually they enjoy it, do they get uh, the reward from Hashem for the great, great mitzvah of Talmud Torah? So uh, this seems to be a machlokas. Let's start off with the famous text that everybody knows. The famous text of, that the Gemara says is that a person should always learn Torah and do mitzvahs even if they're not doing it for the sake of heaven, even if it's Shalom Lishma. And the reason that's given is Shemi Toch Shalom Lishma. By doing it even for ulterior motives, you will eventually come to Lishma. So there seems to be a machlokas between the Balatanya and the Nefesh Achayim about how to interpret that particular statement. The Balatanya takes the position that when you learn Tyre Shalom Lishma, it essentially does not elevate you, it does not purify you, but when you eventually become Lishma, retroactively, all of that Torah that's in the floor gets elevated and sanctified. So therefore, it's Kadai to learn as much Torah as you can, even Shalom Lishma, not because right now it's doing anything, but it's like a bank account that can be activated when you become Lishma later. Which means, from the perspective of the here and now, it's nothing, but it can become activated, Lama Freya. So he says, if I learned Torah for 30 years just for intellectual reasons, and then after 30 years I'm Lishma, my 30 years of Torah now get elevated. That's the Alter Rebbe. The Nefesh Chaim doesn't like it. Nefesh Chaim says, Chas v'shalom. Every single word of Torah you learn is a great, 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 great mitzvah at the very time. It's not the highest madrega, it's not lishma, but you certainly have the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. So, there is, so I think your very question is in fact a, a machlokas. But let me point out another thing that uh, Rav Chaim Velazhenur brings from the, Vilna, from the name of the Vilna Gaon. And that is, there is actually a stira here. On one hand, the Gemara says you should learn Taira Shalom Lishma because it'll bring you Lishma. But there's another Gemara that says he who learns Torah Shalom Lishma, it would have been better if he never would have been created. He shouldn't have been created. In fact, it's very graphic language. It says uh, uh, his placenta should have strangled him. <laughs> Meaning to say he should have died at birth. So Tosis asked the Kasha, so one Gemara says, Shalom Lishma will bring you to Lishma. The other says, your life was worthless. So Tosvas is Mechalek between two types of Shalom Lishma. There is a Shalom Lishma that is not optimal, but it's still very worthwhile. And there's another Shalom Lishma that's actually evil and destructive. The Shalom Lishma that is not optimal, but it's still benign, it's still positive, that's your case. I learn because I enjoy it intellectually. I learn because I want to acquire knowledge. Okay, so that's not the highest level, but mitoch shalom lishma, bal lishma. But then there's another type of learning shalom lishma where you're doing it lekanter, that's the word. Lekanter means I'm doing it to humiliate people. In other words, I'm doing it because I want to show that rabbi that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Or I'm doing it in other words, if I just do it as a show-off for me, that shalo, that, that's actually the first Shalom Lishma. But if I do it to humiliate and to discredit Judaism and the like, at that point, uh, the, the, that learning is sinful. Not only is it Shalom Lishma, but that you don't get scarred for Talmud Torah in that case. And that uh, Rav Chaim Velazhenur, Velazhenur brings. You know, I still remember uh, my one foray into, into activism. I never did it again. Uh, I think I was in ninth grade or something, 
and I was in Eretz Israel, and uh, Jew, um, Jews for Jesus came into town, missionaries. And they were holding and hold a big meeting in Baltimore, kind of to expose themselves, uh, expose their teachings to, to unsuspecting Jews. So some of these uh, older students at Near Israel wanted to organize a group where we should show up and we should go over to the unsuspecting members of the audience and say, would you like to know something about real Judaism? And we would communicate the truth, etc. So I was part of the group. I was younger, but I, you know, they took me along uh, with other younger people. And uh, I was explaining something to a guy and he was so interested and I was really, really kind of proud of myself. I was talking and giving him this proof and that proof and that proof and that proof. And he was taking notes and I said, wow, Baruch Hashem, I uh, saved a Jew from Shmad. It turned out this guy was the leader of uh, the missionary Jews and he wanted to get all the notes so he could prepare his own refutation and wh whatever it was. As he was going to use it, Le Cantor, to discredit uh, uh, orthodoxy and relatory Judaism. So I decided at that point my career as an activist was, uh, was over at that point. Uh, so you have to be careful. So that, that's what Tysus means by Lacantir. There's no, there's no Indian of Talmud Torah. No right. Mitzvah Talmud Torah in that case. Yeah. Uh, over this piece on Seder, I asked my Rav, uh, permission to lean. And he, to lean, yes. To lean. yes. He happened to mention offhandedly that the culture or nature of uh, actions of respect are, are done less so often nowadays. And I also just... McGare, I just got the ability to wrap to fill in, and I also learned that you shouldn't take off your head to fill in uh, in front of your rabbi. You should turn out of respect. What other areas of respect nowadays should be in practice that maybe aren't as in practice? Yeah, yeah, just, just to be sure everyone understands the halakhic background. Uh, Haseba, of course, the way we do Haseba today anyway is not real reclining. A uh, real reclining where you're on a couch, etc., and, uh, and the like. In fact, some people do that. I just read that during COVID, where sometimes husband and wife would have a Seder alone and their kids wouldn't join them. So they actually experimented with like uh, sitting on the floor and <laughs> whatever. They, they said it was great actually. They really experienced the sense of uh, cheres and the like. And that's why the Ravya, one of the Rishainim actually paskins, that you're not chayiv in a Seba at all today because it's not, our, it's not the practice that we have. But okay, we don't follow the Ravya, but there is such a shita. So one of the halachas of a Seba is because a Seba is this unrestricted freedom. So there is a concept that in the presence of your Rebbe, you're not supposed to do that type of reclining unless uh, the Rebbe gives you permission. Now today, as, as your uh, Rev really basically said, it's, it is assumed that you have that permission. We don't insist on that type of kavot and the like. And the same thing with tefillin, according to the Gemara, it was a bit of a chutzpah to take off your head tefillin in front of your Rebbe. But let me point out that there's a big difference. In the time of the Gemara, the standard Jewish practice was to wear tefillin the whole day. So taking off your tefillin is kind of like taking off your shirt. It's kind of undressing in front of your Rebbe. Today, it bichlal wouldn't have that implication because we only wear tefillin during davening. It's not like undressing part of my regular, my regular clothing. Uh, so he is 100% correct that standards of what is considered to be respectful or deferential behavior uh, do change in time. And uh, the halacha is anyway that the Rebbe can always be mochel, any of those uh, honors and the like, and uh, we make assumptions that there is, uh, that there is a mechila. Um, I think another example, maybe it's a little more controversial, is the notion of uh, argumentation with your Rebbe, meaning if you read the Gemara, it seems to me the Rebbe says something, you know, you're not allowed like, to almost raise a question or argue with it. And today it's, it's, it's generally assumed that there is a give and take in a respectful way. So a lot of the etiquette does, does change with, with time. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. Kibbut Aviyam is another example. According to the law of the Gemara, uh, whenever your parent enters a room, your father or your mother, you must stand up. Every single time they enter a room, you must stand up. Today, even among uh, you know, the most religious people, that usually is not the case. And the reason that's given is because the parents don't expect it, and it would almost be a, a tircha to, that they have to say, oh, sit, sit, you know, and, and the like. But I think it's brought down, I think the Chazanish said, that even though we don't follow that today because it's not expected and the parents are mochel, 
but there still should be a practice that the first time the kids see their parents, let's say the kids are in the dining room before mom and dad, they should stand up. There should be like one time a day that they do such a thing. Similarly, there is a halacha that uh, you're not allowed to sit in a chair that is your father or your mother's chair. And I think more people do actually keep that halacha uh, than the standing up. But still, many people are makel on it. And again, because mom and dad don't necessarily expect it. Uh, the Chavitz Chaim uh, had a daughter who was born from his second wife, and she was uh, a bas sekunim. She was born t you know, towards the end of his life, so she was much younger than her uh, siblings. And uh, she writes, she has interesting stories. She writes about uh, the Chavitz Chaim as an old man was a very undemanding father. Like, he didn't really care about the kavod. She used to sit in the chair. Uh, he didn't mind uh, anything. Uh, she did say, interestingly enough, this is just a digression, that the one thing he was, he was never mocked on his kavod. That made no difference at all. But the one thing he was mocked on is that she has to be a truthful person. He did not tolerate sheker. So she tells the story that when the Mishnah Brewers came from the printers, you know, when you go over a printed book, sometimes there are blank pages. You know, pages that the ink didn't, didn't, get, didn't get onto. So you have to flip through the book to be sure there are no blank pages. It's very quick, but you know, you have to flip through it. So uh, the Chavitz Chaim had like a few hundred sets. Each set is six volumes of the Mishnah Brura. So he asked his daughter, can you check 10 sets for me? So she was running out to play. Even the Chavit Chaim had uh, children that sometimes they didn't always uh, obey him. So she said, I can't do it now. I got to go play. But I, when I come back, I'll do 100 sets. So she comes back three hours later. It's already like 11 o'clock at night. And there are 600 volumes of Mishnah Bura on the table. That's 100 sets of Mishnah Bura. So she says, 600? You only asked me to do 60. And now you're giving me you know, 10 times? He says, you said a hundred sets, you can't lie. Whatever a Jewish person says, they have to be truthful. So that, she said, her father was very mocked. When it came to Midos and Emes and Sheker, he was very, very strict. When it came to Kavod, he was very, very lenient in that way because he was not concerned for his own Kavod. She did tell a story that sometimes, though, his standards were so strict that she had to get away so she used to uh, sleep in the cemetery in Raden because the Chavitz Chaim was a Kohen. He's not allowed to go into a cemetery. A Bas Kohen could go to a cemetery. <laughs> so she said she had to get away. She'd go into the cemetery <laughs> that, in that way. You know, it's not so easy being the Chavitz Chaim's kid, right? There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> right? you have to, in fact, uh, I, I mentioned before a famous, beautiful story about um, there was a rabbi who was speaking in Miami and he said he heard the story of the Chavitz Chaim that there was a boy who was Machal Shabbos. And the Chavitz Chaim spoke to the boy and the boy changed his whole life by, by one, like one minute conversation with the Chavitz Chaim. And the rabbi said, if I only knew what the Chavitz Chaim said to change that boy's life, I would have the secret of motivation. That's the greatest thing a teacher could have, how to motivate. So from the back of the audience, an old man gets up on a walker, like 95 years old. This never happens to me. And he says, I am that boy. This happened you know, so many years ago. <laughs> Amazing thing. So he says, what did the Chavitz Chaim say to you? He says, I was smoking on Shabbos. And I got caught. And they said, you have to go to the Chavitz Chaim. The Chavitz Chaim was not involved in the yeshiva on a daily basis. It wasn't like you'd see him every day. He was already old. So to see the Chavitz Chaim was like seeing God. I mean, scary, scary, scary. And the boy says, I was so, or the man says, now, I was so scared. I was going to see the Chavitz Chaim. I didn't know what would happen. And I go there and I'm shaking. And finally, I see the Chavitz Chaim. The Chavitz Chaim is so short. I was already, as a 15-year-old, I was taller than the Chavitz Chaim. And he takes my hand, and his eyes were blue, very, very deep blue. And he takes his hand, my, my hand, and tears come down his eyes onto my hand. And I still feel the heat of those tears. And all he said to me was, 
Shabbos, Shabbos. And I saw in his eyes the pain of Chilol Shabbos and the love that he had for me, that I've, you know, I'm sinning against God. What is it doing to me? And I said, I could never betray the Chavitz Chaim again. And then he extrapolated to Hashem. And that's what happened, right? That's how the Chavitz Chaim changed him. But then there's an act two, and this is the reason I'm bringing it up. Uh, act two was uh, the Chavitz Chaim told the boy, you can't be in yeshiva anymore. You're Michal Shabbos. We cannot have you in yeshiva. So the boy starts walking away. So the Chavitz Chaim says, where are you going? So he says, Rebbe just told me I can't stay in yeshiva, so I'm going. So the Chavitz Chaim says, just because you can't stay in yeshiva doesn't mean you can't stay in my house. Stay in my house, I'll learn with you. So when people hear this story, they think, hey, wait a second here. So the bad guys, you know, get all the, get all the prizes? I mean, here you have a person who's a masmid and radin who learns Yom Mambalayla and keeps all the mitzvahs, and he never even sees the Chavitz Chaim. And here you have the kid that's Mechal Shabbos, he gets the Chavitz Chaim as a Chavrusa. This is what the Gemara calls Chotei Niskar. The sinner wins? What's going on? But the answer is, it's not a pasha thing to have the Chavitz Chaim as a Chavrusa. You think it's an easy thing? Yeah, there, there's what you might call bragging privileges, maybe. But you know, with the Chavitz Chaim, number one, you obviously cannot say any Lashon Hara during the Seder. <laughs> and number two, you, you really can't schmooze at all. It's like going to be 100% intensive learning. So it's a challenge. So uh, the point I'm making is, to be a child of the Chavitz Chaim is an enormous, enormous suchus. But it can be challenging sometimes. So uh, the woman who became Rebbitz and Zacks, is, that was his last daughter, she sometimes had to go to the cemetery to uh, decompress a little bit. Uh, there wasn't a lot to do in Radin, so the cemetery, you know, there was no, no pizza place or anything else. So uh, the cemetery was like uh, <laughs> the most lively place you can go outside, <laughs> outside of the Beis Medrash. Yeah, okay, any, any, uh, anyone else? Uh, yeah. Um, there's a discussion on the authorship origin and the authenticity of the Zohar. Are you familiar with that? The authenticity of? The Zohar. Yes, the Zohar, yeah. And I was just wondering, based on your understanding of the, the different arguments for the book that it was in the 14th century or the 12th century, yep. written by the, the, the man who found it in actuality, or written by the students of Rabbi Shimbaicha, or written by Shimbaicha and stuff, all these different uh, theories, how does that affect the authenticity for the Zohar and its impact uh, on Judaism? As we understand yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually think uh, this very interesting question mm -hmm. is less important practically than people think it is. Let me explain why. Uh, we have the Zohar. The Zohar is the main text of Jewish Kabbalah. Right? Kabbalah and Zohar are not synonymous. Right? Kabbalah is a whole body of esoteric wisdom. The Zohar is a particular book that contains uh, Kabbalistic teachings. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of other Kabbalistic books, but most of them are based on the Zohar. So the Zohar is almost like the Tanakh. The Zohar is almost like the written Torah of Kabbalah, which has many, 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 many commentaries. Now, our tradition normally teaches that the Zohar are the teachings of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, who was a Tana who lived shortly after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, and he was a Talmud of Rabbi Akiva, and he's buried up in Meiron, near Tzvat, and Lag Baomer is said to be, said to be We'll talk about that, the anniversary of his death, and that's why hundreds of thousands of people uh, go to Meiron. Uh, two years ago, uh, there was an, a very great tragedy in Meiron, but, but, but Bezer Sashem, uh, people should be, uh, should be safe. Uh, and therefore, the tradition was that we dated the Zohar all the way back to around the time shortly after the destruction of the Second Temple, which would make it equal to the Mishnah and, and, and everything else, even earlier than the Mishnah. And yet, it's also the case that the Zohar was not publicized until the 1200s, that there was a Mekubal, Rav Moshe de Leon, who claimed to have found this long lost concealed manuscript that he said was the Zohar of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, and he publicized it, this is before printing, but he made manuscripts and then eventually it was printed, etc. So ever since that happened, there's been a perennial debate 
Is the Zohar authored by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, or is the Zohar the product of Rabbi Moshe de Leon, who, so to speak, did reverse plagiarism, right? Plagiarism is when I take your teachings and I put it in my name. This is the other way around. I take my teachings and I put it in the name of somebody who's greater. The most of our gedolim, I include the Vilna Gon, the Ramchal, the Arizal, considered the Zohar to be the product of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. There is a minority of gedolim, such as Rabbi Yaakov Emden and some of the Yemenite gedolim, who take the position that it's the product of Rav Moshe de Leon. Uh, others have a middle-of-the-road position that they say that there is uh, a core of the Zohar, that's Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, and then there were additional things that were made because there are Amorayim uh, after Rav Shimon Bar Yochai who are mentioned in the Zohar and the like. So in a sense, uh, I would say that the authorship of the Zohar is still not conclusively settled. And by the way, most academics, although that doesn't mean anything per se, uh, do go with the Rav Moshe de Leon. A minority go with Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. Most academics look at Rav Moshe de Leon. Um, well, that was Rav Yaakov Emden's position. Most of our gedolim go with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But the point I want to make is this. Maybe it's not so important, because here's the thing. Regardless of who wrote it, the teachings of the Zohar have been accepted by hundreds of uh, gedolim, thousands of gedolim, who see it as Kabbalistic truth. In other words, it has become part of the Torah that is transmitted from generation to generation. So what difference does it ultimately make if it's from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai? I mean, listen, at a minimum, Rabbi Moshe de Leon is a Rishon. At a minimum, 1200s. It's not like, oh, the Zohar was discovered yesterday. And, you know, so, so now it's from the 1200s. So I think that you, have, you can't ignore the fact that the Ari looked at the Zohar as expressing emes, and the Ramak looked at, Rav Moshe Kodivero looked at the Zohar as expressing emes, and the Ramchal, and the Gra, and the Baal Shem Tov, and the Mezerich Ramagid, and the Balatanya. The huh? The Gaon? Of course, the Vilna Gaon wrote commentaries on the Zohar. People don't realize, the Vilna Gaon wrote more on Kabbalah than on Halacha. Uh, of course, Vilna Gaon has voluminous writings on Kabbalah, the Tikkun Zohar, Tikkun Zohar, many, many, many things. So you hear my point? My point is that authorship may be less important if the tochan, if the content of the teaching has been accepted by Gedolim as authentic Torah teachings. And that for sure you cannot deny. Now, there are segments of Am Yisrael that have not accepted not only the authorship issue, they have not accepted the teachings of the Zohar. This was a real, real serious issue in Yemen. You know, on most hand, for the most part, Taimonim, just like regular Svardim, so to speak, are very much into Kabbalah. But there was a segment of the Taimonim called the Dordea, which actually rejected the Zohar Legamri. They considered it to be uh, an erroneous book. And they only went with the Rambam. They only accepted the Rambam. They did not accept the Zohar at all. And uh, there was a big controversy here because some maintained if you don't accept the Zohar as a holy book, you might be called an apicorus. Others say it's not an article of faith. And for Kerik, they took the position if you accept the Zohar as, an ho as a holy book, you're an apicorus. This was a tough issue because there were those who maintained the Zohar was apicorus. Although the mainstream is the other way around, that the Zohar represents a holy expression. So, uh, in fact, um, the grandson of the founder of this anti-Zohar movement, Rav Kapach, was in Eretz, he just died a few years ago. He was a great Yemenite Rav in Eretz Israel, and he was on the, the Bastin, the highest Bastin, Beit 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 and Chashu uh, Talmud Chacham, he translated all of the Rambam's, he retranslated all of the Rambam's Arabic books into Hebrew, he made new translations of the Mora Nebuchim, of the Perish of Mishnayis, Rav Kapach, Rav Yosef Kapach, very, very chashev. But there were those who whispered behind his back 
that he's puzzled to be a Dayan because he's an Apikores, because he believed his grandfather's Hashkafa. Right? So there were, there were those types of things. So that was an unusual. The Dordea is a bit of an unusual segment of Am Yisrael. Very, very religious people, very knowledgeable people who did not accept the Zohar at all. But with respect to the overwhelming mainstream of Am Yisrael that were Shomer Mitzvahs, even if they attributed authorship to Rav Moshe de Leon, they accepted it as a book of valid teachings. So that's why I say I think the authorship may be less important. You know, in the 1200s, it would have been a major issue. <laughs> if, there was, if the Zohar comes out today, you know, hey, if you wrote it yesterday, you know, why should I pay attention? But by now, it's been 800, you know, more, been, uh, almost 1,000 years. Uh, yeah, did you want to say anything? Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, we're going to have to respect uh, Zohar as uh, Torah as a writer. It's not Torah as a writer. It's not really. So, you know, again, I, I don't want to get in trouble here. I, 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 let me just say this. When, when people make a statement, which, which many people do, if you don't believe in the Zohar, you are not Bikoris or a Kofir, I, 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 I would not say that. I would say, if you don't believe in the Zohar, you are making a mistake, because so many great, great, great uh, people consider the Zohar holy. But belief in the Zohar is not a, a Nikar Emunah. It is not... Uh, a foundational principle. If I don't believe in the Torah from Hashem, or I don't believe in the Gemara, that, that is an article of faith, I don't think the Zohar falls in that category. So as I say many, many times, you have to differentiate between mistaken beliefs and heretical apicorsis belief. Yeah, a lot of things can be mistaken, but that doesn't make me an apicorsis. It makes me an idiot, maybe. Uh, but it doesn't make me an because I've said it, for example, about the issue of Mashiach coming back from the dead. Some people say, Apikorsis. I, I would say, no, it's not Apikorsis. Uh, the mainstream implications of Chazal is it's not going to happen that way. But there are minority opinions, even in Chazal, that such a thing is possible. So you could say it's a mistake to have that belief. But that, that, that doesn't make you an Apikorsis. You know, Apikaris gets thrown around too loosely. I mean, people say now, if you're in favor of military service for, for Yeshiva Bachrim, you're an Apikaris. Well, once again, you can say that's wrong, and you can say that's bad, and you can say it's not proper, but Apikaris is, right, is not the right word for that. You're not a kofir in an Iker Emunah because you have a certain view about the army or about secular education or about Yom HaTzmahot, right? We're finishing Yom HaTzmahot uh, and the like. These are Hashkafic issues, but people can have machloksim about Hashkafic issues. It doesn't make them an apikoris. So we misuse the word apikoris, kofir. We, 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 we use it, we misapply it when it doesn't really apply to a lot of those things. Yeah. Here's another send in. Uh, on one hand, we say that the world and all that's in it belongs to Hashem. And on the other hand, we have many tractates of Gemara that detail intricate private property laws. How do we reconcile these seemingly contradictory worldviews in which we own nothing, but we also exercise ownership? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, now, the Gemara itself raises an interesting question of psukim. On one hand, it says, Lashem ha'aretzum loa. To God, right? This is the Shir Shalyom of, of Sunday. To Hashem is the world and everything in it. That's one Pasuk. Then we have another Pasuk. It says in Hallel, Hashemayim Shemayim Lashem. The heavens are the heavens of God. Viha'aretz Nasan Livnei Adam. But the earth he gave to people. So the Gemara asked the Kasha. That implies I was given ownership. Lashem Aratzim Loa implies God owns everything. Now the Gemara itself answers, Kan Kaidem Bracha, Kan Lachar Bracha. Let's take an apple. If I eat an apple without a bracha, I'm stealing God's property. I'm a thief. Once I make a bracha, God allows me to have it. So I think you can take that Gemara and extend it a little bit. And that is, as long as man acknowledges that Hashem is the creator, Hashem has given me permission. So I'm not the true owner, but Hashem has given me permission to deal with the property as kind of an agent of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that would give me rights and responsibilities and obligations and privileges vis-a-vis -vis the property because I acknowledge that Hashem is the ultimate owner. 
But when I don't have that bracha, then indeed my ownership is illegitimate, so to speak, or it doesn't exist. So that would be, I think that Gemara would be the key uh, to that particular uh, particular issue. Uh, yeah. So, um, thank you. Uh, so you kind of touched on this the other day. Actually, you just kind of touched on it now. Um, when you were talking about your shia, I think it was on Tuesday uh, or Monday, about how um, that it is a chilul Hashem to disrespect or to, to not um, stand still for Yom HaZikaron or Yom HaShoah. Uh, even though they are publicly, yeah. Holiday, yeah. Secular holidays. Yeah. That kind of extends to a larger topic of particularly the relationship between some Haredi or Hasidic sects and how they view one, the state of Israel, uh, and, to, and also how they, how they view Chilonim, uh, particularly. How they view women, you said? Oh, Chilonim, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, and my question is specifically, you know, say like a sect like Satma, who are specifically anti Zionist, um, because of their views on. Um, the nature of being Jewish is in a covenant. Could you explain that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, again, this is actually a topic that uh, one could spend uh, many, many, many hours on. And uh, there were years that uh, you know, we, I gave uh, more, more extended classes on it. Uh, if you take the position of Satmar or the position of what's called Niture Karta, which is a combination of Hasidim and non-Hasidim, Niture Karta is not automatically a Hasidic organization, but there are many Satmar in the Karta, and they believe that the very existence of a state of Israel uh, is a violation of Hashem's law because we're not allowed to have our own state until the coming of Mashiach, and they base it on a Gemara and Kesuvas that I, I don't want to go into right now. Now, I want to make it very, very clear. The Satmar position is not based on the irreligious nature of the state. Even if the prime minister and the cabinet and all the members of the Knesset would be gedole Torah mamish, even if that would be the case, they would still say that it's usher. It's not because of the irreligious nature. They say the etzem establishment of the state is a merida. It is a rebellion against Hashem because Hashem put us into galus and we don't have the right to kind of take ourselves out of Golas till God gives us the signal through the coming of Mashiach. Now that's a very, very extreme position. Now, I do want to point out though, that even the Satmarev, who is a pretty extreme in this, in this view, he still would legitimate the defending of Jewish lives. Meaning, uh, if you have an army that protects Jewish lives that are in danger, he would not say, let's dismantle the army. He would be in favor of dismantling the state and having the population assimilate in a larger Palestinian country, although that's hardly workable, but that, that was the theory of it. But uh, he was masking that Jewish lives ought to be defended. And that, that's a very important point uh, to keep in mind. Now, others took the position the, the other way around. Uh, the religious Zionists take, this, take the position that not only is statehood desirable, but it's part of the process of Mashiach. Mashiach comes by Jewish people coming here and s establishing sovereignty. And therefore, this is a messianic stage in bringing Mashiach. And then you have what you might call middle-of-the-road position, which I think many, many Haredim actually uh, agree with, and that is, listen, we don't consider the state messianic, and we don't consider the state satanic. <laughs> Meaning, when Karta says it's satanic, and uh, Dati Yumi says messianic, we say it's an opportunity that God gives us. Now there is Baruch Hashem that in the ashes of the Holocaust, he gave the Jewish people an opportunity to build a home, to create an environment where we can do mitzvahs, where we can do Torah. So we have to be grateful for what Hashem has given us and even grateful to soldiers and police and garbage men for the infrastructure they created. But at the same time, we recognize that there's so much that we don't have. So uh, Yom Atzmut may not be a holiday uh, for many, but I think it's a time of Hakara Satov. And I, I mentioned the other day how important Hakara Satov is in Yiddish guy. So those are kind of the three views, Satanic, Messianic, and Hakara Satov, recognizing the shortcomings and the problems that, that do exist. And I think the problem in the Haredi world sometimes is that there's not enough of Hakara Satov, meaning, we focus on the negatives, and there are negatives. I'm not, I'm not going to uh, you know, ignore 
the many, many negative issues that a religious person will face uh, in Israel, religious societies face. But it should not take away the Hakara Satayf for what Hashem has given us and for what even the Chiloni Jews have given us. This is what Rav Cook tried to identify, this is before the State of Israel, but he tried to identify again and again and again that he saw, even in the Zionist, secular Zionist endeavor, he saw a certain sanctity and a certain holiness. So the same thing is true with Chilonim. You know, uh, I hear kids sometimes who talk about Chiloni, you know, secular Jews, they call them Goyim. You know, they're Goyim. That's an awful way to talk. That's not, uh, that, that, again, I don't want to be critical of, of Haredim either. But you have to look at every Jew as precious, as beloved, as someone that potentially can become very close to God. In fact, Lubavitch Rebbe had a good point. Uh, you know, we talk about like Or Sameach's mission or Eishat Torah's mission. We talk about it as Kirov, right? Kirov. Now, Kirov is really a shorthand term. Kirov Rechokim. What is Kirov Rechokim? To draw people near who are far from God. Kirov Rechokim. So Lubavitch Rebbe didn't like the expression. Lubavitch Rebbe said, why do you say when you help a Jew become more religious, you're taking somebody who's far from God and drawing him near? Every Jew is close to God. They just don't know it yet. So it's not Kirov Rechokim. Who says he's a Rachak? Then, of course, the Rebbe added a little twist of the knife and saying, and besides, how do you know who's a Rachok and who's a Karov? Maybe he's closer than you. <laughs> that's another, that's another Nakuda in that, in that particular sense. So I think there is a concept of too much labeling. We label too much. We label too much, you know. None of us are perfect. All of us are sinners. So some people sin in this way, some people sin in this way. We have to work with Achdus Abbas Yisrael and understand that by love we will bring people closer to Hashem. We, were not, we will not bring them closer to Hashem by condemnation and by denigration. I remember many, many, many years ago I was uh, teaching um, in Columbia, Maryland, a group of non-religious people, uh, and a woman went over to me after the shear, and she said, I don't even remember what her question was, but I remember how she prefaced her question. She prefaced her question. She says, I'm not as religious as you, but something. So I said at the time, and I think it was a good, a good response, the Kodesh Prophet gave me the right words, that why do you say you're not as religious as, as and maybe you're more religious. I mean, maybe I keep Shabbos more than you do, but maybe you honor your parents more than me. You know, maybe you give stucca, maybe you treat people better. That's also part of being religious. Religious is not just Shabbos and Kashrus and Bein Adam Lamakam. Religious is also Bein Adam Lachavera. So I don't look at somebody as not religious. Rather, they may be religious in other areas in which maybe I fall short. So I can learn from them. They can learn from me. Right? We have to be open in that, in that way. Now, in defense of Haredi uh, looking down, denigration, let me point out that in the early years of the State of Israel, in the aftermath of the Holocaust after World War II, the religious Jews of Eretz were, were a relatively small number. And the government, had Ben-Gurion and the like, had very powerful agendas to kind of assimilate them. And sometimes children from the Shoah, from the Holocaust, who were brought to Israel from religious families, but they lost their parents. They were deliberately placed in irreligious kibbutzim so they should forget about Torah. They were given tray food, uh, children with payas. The payas was forcibly shaved. Now, that created a residual memory in the Haredi community of the government as an enemy that tried to destroy them. Those are very powerful. You know, if you came to Israel later, like me, you know, I don't, I don't have a memory of those experiences, but those who were here, they really, really saw almost a forcible uprooting. And that created a great deal of hatred, a great deal of animosity. Now, the truth is, things have changed today. First of all, the Haredi community is many, many, many times larger. If in the 1940s it was a tiny little group of people that could have been easily crushed, 
Today, that's not the case, number one. Number two, although there's still you know, anti-religious issues, but the Chiloni of today is not like the Chiloni then. The Chiloni of today is not trying to uproot. The Chiloni today is ignorant, mainly ignorant. So the problem is that, you know, the old saying, that the worst thing a general can do, the biggest mistake a general does, is to fight the last war. Because the war is different, the challenges are different. And yet the emotional mindset is rooted in the 40s and 50s. And that's kind of why you have going on. Now I'll tell you a little story about Rav Kook. This goes back to the early part of the 20th century, before there was a state of Israel. Rav Kook, in the early uh, 1900s, like, like 1908, like really, really early, so Rav Kook and Rav Yosef Chaim Zunnenfeld, who people think are enemies, right? The opposite, but they, they, went, they went together on a tour of the very anti-religious kibbutzim throughout uh, Israel to kind of bring them Torah and Avodah, and it was a wonderful, wonderful trip. And there's a story about one of these kibbutzim that Rav Kook came to a very, very, not just non-religious, anti-religious kibbutz. They served pork. They didn't observe anything on Shabbos at all. And Rav Kook came, and Rav Kook asked, would it be possible just to make a minion for Shabbos? And the kibbutz said, no. <laughs> We're not going to make a minion. We don't do that here. So Rav Kook didn't say anything. He sat in the dining room. He brought his own little bread. Didn't eat the food, but he sat with the people. He talked with the people. He didn't say any divrei Torah on Shabbos at all. He just talked with the people. And at the end, Motzei Shabbos, he was leaving. And he gave them a talk. And he, once again, he didn't say any divrei Torah at all. He just said, it was such a pleasure to be with you. And I hope that we'll continue together to build up the land. And then he left. The next day, the kibbutz koshered its kitchen and only uh, had kosher food from that time on. What's the pshat? Rav Kook didn't give them a musr shmus. Rav Kook did not give them any type of tochach at all. He didn't even give them dibri Torah because he knew they wouldn't receive it and they would just think this rabbi is coming to convert them. And they would have resented it and they would have ignored it. What did Rav Kook show them? He showed them respect. He showed them, I value what you're doing. Maybe there are things that I don't agree with, but what you're doing in building the land is good. And when a person feels validated, they're going to be open to the other things. And therefore they said, if he would have told us we have to keep kosher, we would have just ignored him for sure. He didn't tell us anything. Then we said, you know, such a rabbi is somebody we really should listen to. And they koshered the kibbutz because Rav Kook specifically never told them that they had to keep it kosher. Okay, so I think that's a lesson. And uh, that's not the way things are. That's very true. That's not the way things are. But as I say, part of it is a residual painful memory from the 40s and 50s. Okay? Yeah. Going off of respect, yeah. Yeah, so uh, here's the thing. I, I remember uh, there used to be an organization in Israel. Maybe it's still here. I don't know. It's called uh, Common Denominator. Uh, and I once saw a list, which was to facilitate dialogue between religious Jews and non-religious Jews. And they had a list of rules. And among them were no throwing of chairs is allowed. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was a joke or maybe not, maybe not a joke. <laughs> and the like, you know, no profanity, you know, whatever it could be. So I would say that those are your base rules. You've got to start off, start off with that, no throwing of furniture and the like. Um, you know, part of it is this. I can look at a Jew or a person generally and say or feel, maybe I won't say it, they're all wrong but I can respect the integrity of their search. They're looking for truth. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for purpose. I can respect that. I respect a person who is trying to find God, even if they're doing it in a way that is not, I, I don't believe is the, correct, is the correct way. So you try to focus on what is good in what they're doing, and then 
what's going to happen is they will then focus on your good. In fact, this is a pasuk that's relevant to all of this. Shlomo HaMelech was the wisest of all people, right? The wisest. And he says in Mishlei, a famous pasuk that ought to be a motto, and that is, Kamayim aponim alponim kain leva adam liadam, as water reflects the face that you show it. So the heart of man reflects that which you show it. What does that mean? The Vilna Gaon says, if I look at a reflecting pool of water, whatever face I show the water is what I'll see in the water. I smile at the water, a smiling face. I frown at the water, a frowning face. So too, says Shlomo, the heart of man will reflect back that which I show it. I show you that I denigrate you. I do not mach of you. I, I don't think you have anything valuable to contribute. You're going to feel that way about me. I show you validation. I show you respect. You'll feel that way about me. So the key, if you want to communicate religion, you want to communicate Torah, you want to communicate the things that we know are emes. Paradoxically, we have to do it by showing respect and a certain amount of legitimation to the other person. You see, you can't communicate it by saying you're, you know, you're garbage. And what happens in Eretz Israel, and it's not only Haredi, I got it, I got it, it's the whole Israeli style of debate. Even, even outside of religion, you know, the, is the notion of, uh, you know, I'm right, and you're either an idiot or you're evil. You're either an idiot or a malek. That's the two choices. Now, what happens is, I go around calling people idiots or a malek. They're going to call me parasites or, or whatever it is. And the spiral never gets broken because the insults just get higher and higher and higher and higher. So as I up the ante and come up with a new insult for you, you will come up with a new insult for me, whoever it is. The only way you can break what's called this Gordian knot is the other way around. I look at the chayal, I look at the chiloni, and I say, you know, you're a good, you are a good person. You're a caring person. And I understand why we sometimes scare you. We sometimes scare you. You're afraid that we're going to take over your life or whatever it is. And I get it. And I'm, I guarantee you, you will see a softening of their resistance to Torah and mitzvahs, when you can meet them on that, on that, particular, that particular level. I don't know if you saw this the other day when they had these, um, not the other day, but a few weeks ago, when they had all these demonstrations, the secular, you know, liberals really, it wasn't just secular, but you know, the very liberal who were protesting Netanyahu's Supreme Court uh, uh, reforms and the like, and they were acting as if this was like Nazi Germany. So all of a sudden, they were protesting in B'nai Brak. And to the great, great credit of B'nai Brak Yidden, really very, very good. I'm not sure if we would pull it off in Yerushalayim where we tend to be a little militant. The B'nai Brakers did not get involved in any type of insult. And instead, they were playing Jewish music and offering refreshments. And it was Friday, so they were playing Shalom Aleichem, you know, the old Shalom Aleichem. And this secular guy, it became viral on YouTube, this secular guy that was protesting, we don't want a religious country, you know, etc., take over. He started sobbing. He started crying because he remembered that too. He probably hadn't said Shalom Aleichem in 60 years. He was an older guy. And it opened up something in his heart that he had not thought about for 60 years. He had looked at religious people as the enemy. He had looked at religious people as, you want to take away my life. You want to take away my freedom. I hate you for that. Why don't you just let me live the life I want to live? But this opened up a different avenue. He saw the beauty of it. He saw the goodness of it. And he started crying. He started crying. And uh, it's quite amazing. Uh, the transformations you can have when there's this respect and this care for another, for another person. This is why I give, uh, you know, Chabad has its share of controversies <laughs> in many, many ways. Uh, but one of the things I, I like about Chabad is I think Chabad does communicate a sense of respecting a person where, where they're at. And that counts for a lot. Okay, anything, anything else? Yeah. So I'd like to ask some follow-up questions about the Zohar. Yes. Uh, first of all, did Moses 
Kilion claim that uh, Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochai wrote the Zohar and he was just passing it down? Yeah, that, that's exactly the story. Uh, Moshe de Leon claimed to have discovered a long lost buried manuscript in a cave and he said, uh, the manuscript says this is the authorship of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and that was his claim. Now, there's all sorts of mice in here. We don't know how much are true. Uh, <coughs> some say that his own wife said after he died, his own wife said, ah, he told me he was going to make up this story, yeah, story <laughs> etc., because he figured if he wrote a book of Kabbalah, nobody would pay attention to it, so instead he wrote it and claimed it was Rev Shimon Bar Yochai. Other people say that is a totally made-up story, you know, you know, but, but his claim clearly was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if that isn't true and he did make it up, then you couldn't call him a Rishon. You would, couldn't call him even like a, a good year. He lied. He oh, okay. So here I'll tell you an interesting thing. I'll tell you a very interesting thing. There actually is a Gemara that says that if you have a Torah thought that you really believe is true, but nobody's going to accept it if it comes from you, there may be a halachic permission to ascribe it to somebody greater from a past generation. Mm -hmm. Now again, which is exactly what might have happened here, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a concept that MS is so important <laughs> that you're allowed to lie so the MS will be accepted. <laughs> Meaning, if my thought is really true, mm -hmm. I have a right to almost use any means to get it accepted. So there is a Talmudic precedent for what you might call reverse plagiarism. I'd have to, I could find it. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but uh, I, I could find that statement in which uh, something, of course, Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach said about that phenomenon, reverse plagiarism. Uh, somebody went over to him and said, this rabbi gave a whole shear in his own name uh, and he took your chiddush and he said it in his name. So Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach said, I don't mind if he takes my thoughts and says it in his name. I just mind if he takes his thoughts and say it in my name. <laughs> so he was concerned sometimes that people might do it that way. But there is there is a makor for for such such a thing. But all the tzaddikim took the zayar. I mean, everything we have today, mishabura, halachas, is complete, coming from the zayar. All the tzaddikim they they brought the zayar. No, of course, all, of course. All our, like deep. No, right. No, 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 no. So again, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Someone would not be wearing a yarmulke, but be considered a person together. If someone it doesn't say in the in the time of the Gemara, you didn't have to fast the four fasts. But today, if someone breaks the four fasts, he is put together, and so yeah. on. Many, many, many stuff. It's the same thing with the zayr. This is a Accepted thing to say that oh everybody all the tzaddikim were dumb. It's like a little bit. No, no, that's what I, I I agree with you. In other words, all, all I was saying is that who was the author of the Zohar is not Nogeya, the amitus of the contents of the Zohar. The Zohar was makubal. Yeah, but, but it just was uh, Moshe Leal. But it was makubal. If the Arizal, the Gra, the Ramchal, all the all the Chas, all the Gedali Chasidas, they accepted it as the Zohar teaching me emes. MS. Right, but they said it's Moshe Leon, so like everybody, the Ramchal and all the tzaddikim are basing it off of Moshe Leon. That's like a little bit of a... Well, but they made, I mean, they made their judgment. They saw, they saw in this, they saw the Amita Shel Teira. They saw the Amita Shel Teira. So, uh, okay, I, I understand, but, um, okay. But again, I'll, I'll repeat what I said. Uh, you know, it may be very, very foolish. Pirates get her, or pirates get her. Foolish, pirates get her to not accept the Zohar. All I'm saying is I don't think technically you would be a kaifer, that's all. But but avada, it would be a foolish thing to do. It would be an erroneous thing to do, a tais, to live that way. Yeah. You see in Torah that human sacrifice isn't what Hashem desires. Yeah. And yet we also learn, uh, or we've been taught, that the death of a great tzaddik uh, or uh, the deaths during the Holocaust atone for... Since right. the people, it seems as well that the Christian belief of J.C. and his death to be a distorted view of that same type of principle. Oh, you, know, you, you know, there is no question Christianity is based on Judaism with many, many distortions. Uh, Yashka was a Jew. Uh, virtually all of the apostles were Jews. 
In fact, the religion of Christianity as a religion was not even founded until Paul after Yeshka died. So when Yeshka died, he died as a Jew, maybe not a good Jew, but he died as a, as a Jew. And therefore, every idea in Christianity will be connected in some way to a Jewish idea, but it'll get bent, it'll get distorted, it'll get twisted. So the notion that Yashka died as an atonement for humanity is a distortion of the well-known teaching of Chazal that the death of the tzaddikim can be a kapara for people. There is, there is such a thing, right? So this is the same thing. So, yeah, I mean, when people say, oh, how could that be? It sounds Christian. Well, yeah, well, it sounds Christian because Christian based it on Judaism. I mean, Yashka said, love your name. Well, I'll give you an example of how, how you know, people just don't know the most basic things. Uh, a common theme in a lot of Christian writing is to compare Yashka with Hillel because they lived roughly the same time. And they say, ah, Yashka has such a superior morality because when Hillel is asked by the non-Jew, teach me the whole Torah on one foot, Hillel gives what's called the negative rule. What is hurtful to you, don't do to another person. But that's negative. Don't hurt other people. But Yashka had such a higher madrega. He said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Not just don't hurt, but show love. Well, that's great, except for the fact that those very words, they happen to be in the Torah. <laughs> so yeah, Yashka said it, but he's, quote, he's just quoting a passage. Now, there actually is a kasha. If that's the case, why does Hillel use the negative? <laughs> we'll talk about that maybe next week uh, in, in the Chumash classes. Now you have a good kasha. If the Torah says, I'm supposed to love, so Hillel says, don't hurt people? Right? So we'll talk about that uh, later. But that's an example of, of distortion and, and, and the like. So yeah, Hashem doesn't want human sacrifice because we're not... We don't determine what is the appropriate level of atonement. It's Hashem. And normally Hashem wants life. But there are times in which God determines that what would be higher. You know, people don't realize that that's one of the lessons of the Akedah. You know, there are two lessons of Akedah Yitzchak, which are almost opposite lessons. One lesson is your love and commitment to God have to be so great that even if he tells you to kill your only son, you do it. Lesson two, but God doesn't want you to do it. Meaning, there's a lesson in both the magnitude of obedience as well as a lesson of what God does not want you to do. Right? So part of the Akedah is Hashem telling Avram, don't do it. This is not, you have to be willing to do it if you were commanded, but I'm telling you that's not what I want. And that, that's, a very, that's a very important idea as well. They also point out a very interesting thing, that both Judaism and Christianity, a central theme is sacrifice. But in Judaism, it was the willingness of man to sacrifice for the glory of God. In Christianity, it's God sacrificing himself for man. <laughs> so it's interesting that Judaism is about my obligation to serve Hashem, Christianity was about God bending himself to serve me, right? The, the other way around. The crucifixion is going in the opposite, in the opposite direction. Okay, thank you, and have a good, uh, good week and good Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.